Okay, today we are going to be reading um, 2 Thessalonians 1 4. Let's begin. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your pers Persecution. persecutions and huh. in the affli affli Affliction. afflictions that you are enduring. That is Second Thessalonians 1, 4. And now, kindly step in the room one at a time, please. There's no turning back now. Oh, I forgot to do the intro. But today we. Were, <laughs> I was wondering. What I already you were doing. did the intro. I didn't. I already did that. So today we're going to be reading the Bible, and then we're going to be doing the synopsis, and then we're going to be reading. Around the World 90 Days. Hope you enjoy. I'm going to say it again. Kindly step in the room one at a time, please. There's no turning back now. ba da ba da ba da I have no idea what they're doing, but they're pretty crazy. Howdy! How is everyone doing? Still got happy faces, or laughing faces. Probably laughing at my haircut. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, so this is Romans chapter 7. I know everyone already has your Bibles out and open to the correct chapter. So let me go ahead and get started. This is the English Standard Version. Here we go. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from, the, from that law, and if she marries another man, she is an adulteress. Not. She is not an adulteress, sorry. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died, so, uh, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might be might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if 
I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do want to do... Wait... Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members." Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. That is the end of Romans chapter 7. Some deliberations from Paul, and I set my book down over there. But let's just talk about what happened in the last couple chapters. There was the um, the people that came through, and they, they watched them walk through, and uh, Phileas Fogg, he said, um, I almost said Phineas Ferb. Uh, okay, so Phileas Fogg, he said, I've got time. It's kind of like uh, The Incredibles, right? So um, they, they go out, and they decide that they want to... Um, to rescue, or he decides that he wants to rescue the, the lady, the, the, I guess she's a princess. And so they go and they try to rescue the princess and they fail and die. And that's the end of the story. Here's Kimberly to say how it really happened. <laughs> if you kill another character. <laughs> I killed all the characters. <laughs> including the princess who died in the in the first part. off she wasn't a princess she was um the raja's wife yes um and she was educated as a british woman and so basically the guy died and they're like oh we gotta sacrifice her now for some reason whatever weird religion they have tribal tradition <laughs> yeah some tradition so they're like, okay, let's sacrifice her now. So they drugged her so that she didn't struggle and then took her in this gigantic caravan all the way over to their, like, temple kind of thing so that they could sacrifice her at dawn in a fire um, along with her dead husband. So what happens is everybody follows them and they tried to, um, they tried to dig a hole in their wall but um, they, I think somebody hears them and they run off before they are seen. So they wait till morning and um, amidst the, like, I think what happens is. Passport 2 is on, on watch. Yeah, Passport 2. Um, he goes in, grabs her, and they're like, oh my gosh, the dead person got up and picked her up. And now, and they were, like, all stunned, so... So he stowed away in the funeral pyre. Yeah, he stowed away, and they were all stunned and had no idea what was going on, and he just got up and walked away, and they were able to get a good lead before they noticed what had actually happened. And that is what happened. She's about to wake up, and let's see what she does. I'm going to hand it off to Dad. Hello again. I'm back. You're Hi, Granny back. Bear. Da, 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 da. All right. If we live, if we try to live by the law in order to get to heaven, we will fail and die. Yes. That is basically what Romans chapter 7 said. All right. So now we're on... Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne, Chapter 14. 
in which Phileas Fogg descends the whole length of the beautiful valley of the Ganges without ever thinking of seeing it. The rash exploit had been accomplished, and for an hour Passepartout laughed gaily at his success. Sir Francis pressed the worthy fellow's hand, and his master said, Well done, which from him was high commendation, to which Passepartout replied that all the credit of the affair belonged to Mr. Fogg, as for him he had only been struck with a queer idea, and he laughed to think that for a few moments he, Passepartout, the ex-gymnast, ex-sergeant fireman had been the spouse of a charming woman, a venerable embalmed Raja. As for the young Indian woman, she had been unconscious throughout of what was passing, throughout of what was passing, and now wrapped up in a traveling blanket was reposing in one of the hudas. So um, that is a, a kind of a quirky thing of a translated um, uh, novel is that sometimes They'll keep the wording in the original language, and so it doesn't quite make sense in English, but we know what they're saying. All right. What was it originally? Throughout of what was passing. That oh, what language was it in? It, it was originally written in French. Oh. Oh, yeah. Because um, Jules Verne was from Paris. I think he was from Paris. More to follow. Um, the ele Yeah, background coming. All right. The elephant, thanks to the skillful guidance of the Parsi, was advancing rapidly through the, sk the still darksome forest, and an hour after leaving the pagoda had crossed a vast plain. They made a halt at seven o'clock, the young woman being still in a state of complete prostration. The guide made her drink a little brandy and water, but her the drowsiness which stupefied her could not yet be shaken off. Sir Francis, who was familiar with the effects of the intoxication produced by the fumes of hemp, reassured his companions on her account, but he was more disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Phileas Fogg that should Aouda remain in India, she would inevitably fall again into the hands of her executioners. The fanatics were scattered throughout the country and would, despite the English police, recover their victim at Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She would only be safe by quitting India forever. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect upon the matter. The station at Allahabad was reached about ten o'clock, and the interrupted line of railway being resumed would enable them to reach Calcutta in less than twenty-four hours. Phileas Fogg would thus be able to arrive in time to take the steamer which left Calcutta the next day, October 25th, at noon for Hong Kong. The young woman was placed in one of the waiting rooms of the station whilst Passepartout was charged with purchasing for her various articles of toilet, a dress, shawl, and some furs for which his master gave him unlimited credit. Passepartout started off forthwith and found himself in the streets of Allahabad, that is, the city of God, one of the most venerated in India, being built in the junction of the two sacred rivers, Ganges and Jumna, the waters of which attract pilgrims from every part of the peninsula. The Ganges, according to the legends of the Ramayana, rises in heaven, whence, owing to Brahma's agency, it descends to the earth. Passepartout made it a point, as he made his purchases, to take a good look at the city. It was formerly defended by a noble fort, which had since become a state prison. Its commerce had dwindled away, and Passepartout in vain looked about him for such a bazaar as he used to frequent in Regent Street. At last he came upon an elderly, crusty Jew who... <coughs> excuse me who sold second-hand articles, and from, wit from whom he purchased a dress of scotch stuff, a large mantle, and a fine otter-skin pelisse, for which he did not hesitate to pay seventy-five pounds. He then returned triumphantly to the station. By the way, seventy-five pounds back then it was probably a ton of money. The influence to which the priests at Pelagi had subjected Aouda began gradually to yield, and she became more herself, so that her fine eyes resumed all their soft Indian expression. When the poet king Ukaf Udaul celebrates the charms of Queen of Ahame 
Ahamehenagra, he speaks thus. Her shining tresses divided in two parts encircle the harmonious contour of her white and delicate cheeks, brilliant in their glow and freshness. Her ebony brows have the form and charm of the bow of Kama, the god of love, and beneath her long silken lashes the purest reflections and the celestial light swim, and in the sacred lakes of Himalaya, in the black pupils of her great clear eyes, her teeth, fine, equal, and white, glitter between her smiling lips like dewdrops in a passion flower's half-enveloped breast. Her delicately formed ears, her vermilion hands, her little feet, curved and tender as the lotus bud, glittered with the brilliancy of the loveliest pearls of Ceylon, the most dazzling diamonds of Golconda. Her narrow and supple waist, which a hand may clasp around, sets forth the outline of her rounded figure and the beauty of her bosom, where youth in its flower displays the wealth of its treasures, and beneath the silken folds of her tunic she seems to have been modeled in pure silver by the godlike hand of Vikvar Karma, the immortal sculptor. It is enough to say, without applying this poetical rhapsody to Aouda, that she was a charming woman. And in all the European except, except, acceptation of the phrase, she spoke English with great purity, and the guide had not exaggerated in saying that the young Parsi had been transformed by her bringing up. The train was about to start from Allahabad, and Mr. Fogg proceeded to pay the guide the price agreed upon for his service, and not a farthing more, which astonished Passepartout, who remembered all that his master uh -huh. owed to the guide's devotion. He had indeed risked his life in the adventure at Pilaji, and if he should be caught afterward by the Indians, he would with difficulty escape their vengeance." Keone also must be disposed of. What should be done with the elephant which had been so dearly purchased? Phileas Fogg had already determined this question. Parsi, said he to the guide, you have been serviceable and devoted. I have paid for your service, but not for your devotion. Would you like to have the elephant? He is yours. The guide's, the guide's eyes glistened. Your honor is giving me a fortune, cried he. "'Take him, guide,' returned Mr. Fogg, "'and I shall still be your debtor.' "'Good,' exclaimed Passepartout. "'Take him, friend. "'Kioni is brave and faithful beast.' "'And here, uh, sorry, and going up to the elephant, "'he gave him several lumps of sugar, saying, "'Here, Kioni, here, here.' "'The elephant grunted out his satisfaction, "'and clasping Passepartout around the waist,' with his trunk, lifted him as high as his head. Passepartout, not in the least alarmed, caressed the animal, which replaced him gently on the ground. Soon after, Phileas Fogg, Sir Francis Cromartree, and Passepartout, installed in a carriage with Aouda, who had the best seat, were whirling at full speed toward Benares. It was a run of eighty miles and was accomplished in two hours." During that journey, the young woman fully recovered her senses. What was her astonishment to find herself in this carriage on the railway, dressed in European habiliments, hab and with travelers who were quite strangers to her? Her companions first set about fully reviving her with a little liquor, and then Sir Francis narrated to her what had passed— dwelling upon the courage with which Phileas Fogg had not hesitated to risk his life to save her, and recounting the happy sequel of the venture, the result of Passepartout's rash idea. F Mr. Fogg had said nothing, while Passepartout, abashed, kept repeating that it wasn't worth telling. Aouda pathetically thanked her deliverers, rather with tears than words. Her fine eyes interpreted her gratitude better than her lips. Then, as her thoughts strayed back to the scene of the sacrifice and recalled the dangers which still menaced her, she shuddered with terror. Phileas Fogg understood what a passing what was passing in Aouda's mind, and offered, in order to reassure her, to escort her to Hong Kong, where she might remain safely until the affair was hushed up, an offer which she eagerly and gratefully accepted. She had, it seems, a Parsi re re 
relation, who was one of the principal merchants of Hong Kong, which is wholly an English city, though on an island on the Chinese coast. At half past twelve, the train stopped at Benares. The Brahmin legends assert that this city is built on the site of the ancient Kasi, which, like Mahomet's tomb, was once suspended between heaven and earth, though the Benares of today, which the Orientalists call the Athens of India, stands quite unpoetically on this solid earth. Passepartout caught glimpses of its brick houses and clay huts, giving an an aspect of desolation to the place as the train entered it. Benares was Sir Francis Cromartry's destination, the troops he was rejoining being encamped some miles northward of the city. He bade adieu to Phileas Fogg, wishing him all success and expressing the hope that he would come that way again in a less original but more profitable fashion. Mr. Fogg lightly pressed him by the hand, the parting of Aouda, who did not forget what she owed to Sir Francis, betrayed more warmth, and as for Passepartout, he received a hearty shake of the hand from the gallant general. The railway on, the leaving, on leaving Benares passed for a while along the valley of the Ganges, though the window of the carriage the through the window of the carriage, the travelers had glimpses of the diversified landscapes of Bihar, with its mountains clothed in verdure, its fields of barley, wheat, and corn, its jungles peopled with green alligators, its neat villages, and its still thickly leaved forests. Elephants were bathing in the waters of the sacred river, and groups of Indians, <coughs> excuse me, Groups of Indians, despite the advanced season and chilly air, were performing solemnly their pious ablutions. These were fervent Brahmins, the bitterest foes of Buddhism, their deities being Vishnu, their sol the solar god, Shiva, the divine impersonation of natural forces, and Brahma, the supreme ruler of priests and legislators. What would these divine, uh, these divinities, divinities, excuse me, think of India, Anglic 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 Ang um, made into uh, England. Englandized? <laughs> yeah, Englandized. <laughs> Sorry. Anglicized. Um, Anglicized, there it is, as it is today, with steamers whistling and scudding along the Ganges, frightening the gulls with float upon its surface, the turtles swarming along its banks, and the faithful dwelling upon its borders. The panorama passed before their eyes like a flash, save when steam concealed it fitfully from the view. The travelers could scarcely discern the fort of Chupigny, twenty miles southwestward from Benares, the ancient stronghold of the Rajas of Bihar, the or Ghazipur, Excuse me, and its famous rose water factories, or the tomb of Lord Cornwallis, rising on the left bank of the Ganges, the fortified town of Buxar, or Patna, a large manufacturing and trading place where is held the principal opium market of India, or Monkir, the a more than European town, for it is as English as Manchester or Birmingham, with its iron foundries, edge tool factories, and high chimneys puffing clouds of black smoke heavenward. Night came on, the train passed on at full speed in the midst of the roaring of the tigers, bears, and wolves which fled before the locomotive, and the marvels of Bengal, Golconda, ruined Gaur, Mushed, Mushedabad, the ancient capital Burdwan, Hughley, and the French town of um, the French town of Chandernagore, where Passepartout would have been proud to see his country's flag flying, were hidden from the view uh, in the darkness. Calcutta was reached at seven in the morning, and the packet left for Hong Kong at noon, so that Phileas Fogg had five hours before him. According to his journal, he was due at Calcutta on the 25th of October, and that was the exact date of his actual arrival. He was therefore neither behi behindhand nor ahead of time. The two days gained between London and Bombay had been lost, as has been seen in the journey across India. But it is not to be supposed that Phileas Fogg regretted them. 
chapter 15 is called... Uh, it's just chapter 15. So now we're going to read chapter 15, in which the bag of banknotes disgorges some thousands of pounds more. The train entered the station, and Passepartout, jumping out first, was followed by Mr. Fogg, who assisted his fair companion to descend. Phileas Fogg intended to proceed at once to the Hong Kong steamer in order to get Aouda comfortably settled for the voyage. He was unwilling to leave her while they were still on dangerous ground. Just as he was leaving the station, a policeman came up to him and said, Mr. Phileas Fogg, I am he. "'Is this man your servant?' asked the policeman, pointing to Passepartout. "'Yes. Be so good, both of you, as to follow me.' Mr. Fogg betrayed no surprise whatsoever. The policeman was representative of the law, and law is sacred to an Englishman. Passepartout tried to reason about the matter, but the policeman tapped him with his stick, and Mr. Fogg made him a signal to obey. "'May this young lady go with us?' asked, um, asked he, Mr. Fogg. She may, replied the policeman. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout were conducted to the Palki Gari, a sort of four-wheeled carriage drawn by two horses in which they took their places and were driven away. No one spoke during the twenty minutes which elapsed before they reached their destination. They first passed through the black town with its narrow streets, its miserable dirty huts, and squalid population, then through the European town, which presented a relief in its bright brick mansions, shaded by coconut trees and bristling with masts, where, although it was early morning, elegantly dressed horsemen and handsome equipages were passing back and forth. The carriage stopped before the modest-looking house, which, however, did not have the appearance of a private mansion. The policeman, having requested his prisoners, for so truly they might be called, to descend, conducted them to a room with barred windows, and said, "'You will appear before Judge Obadiah at half-past eight. He then retired and closed the door. "'Why, we are prisoners?' exclaimed Passepartout, falling into a chair. Aouda, with an emotion she tried to conceal, said to Mr. Fogg, "'Sir, you must leave me to my fate. It is on my account that you received this treatment. It is for having saved me.' Phileas Fogg contented himself with saying that it was impossible. It was quite unlikely that he should be arrested for preventing a, a suttee. The complainants would not dare present themselves with such a charge. There was some mistake. Moreover, he would not, in any event, abandon Aouda, but would escort her to Hong Kong. But the steamer leaves at noon, observed Passepartout nervously. We shall be on board at noon, replied his master placidly. It was said so positively that Passepartout could not help muttering to himself, Parbleu, that's certain! "'Before noon we shall be on board!' "'But he was by no means reassured. "'At half-past eight the doors opened. "'The policeman entered, and requesting them to follow him, "'led the way to an adjoining hall. "'It was evidently a courtroom, "'and a crowd of Europeans and natives "'already occupied the rear of the apartment. "'Mr. Fogg and his two companions "'took their places on a bench opposite the desks "'of the magistrate and his clerk.' Immediately after, Judge Obadiah, a fat, round man, followed by the clerk, entered. He proceeded to take down a wig which was handed on a nail and put it hurriedly in his, on his head. "'In the first case,' said he, then putting his hand to his head, he exclaimed, "'Heh! This is not my wig!' "'No, your worship,' returned the clerk. "'It is mine.' "'Oh, dear Mr. Oysterpuff, how can a judge give a wise sentence in a clerk's wig?' The wigs were exchanged. Passepartout was getting nervous, for the hands on the face of the big clock over the judge seemed to go round, seemed to go around with terrible rapidity. The first case, repeated Judge Obadiah. Phileas Fogg, demanded Oysterpuff. I am here, replied Mr. Fogg. Passepartout? Present, responded Passepartout. Good said the judge. You have been looked for, prisoners, for two days on the trains from Bombay. But of what are we accused? asked Passepartout impatiently. 
You are about to be informed. I am an English subject, sir, said Mr. Fogg, and I have the right. Have you been ill-treated? Not at all. Very well. Let the complainants come in. A door swung open by order of the judge, and three Indian priests entered. That's it, muttered Passepartout. These are the rogues who were going to burn our young lady. The priests took their places in front of the judge, and the clerk proceeded to read in a loud voice a complaint of sacrilege against Phileas Fogg and his servant, who were accused of having violated a place, a place held consecrated by the Brahmin religion. You hear the charge? asked the judge. Yes, sir, replied Mr. Fogg, consulting his watch, and I admit it. You admit it? I admit it, and I wish to hear these priests admit in their turn what they were going to do at the pagoda of Pilagi. The priests looked at each other. They did not seem to understand what was said. Yes, cried Passepartout warmly, at the pagoda of Pilagi, where they were on the point of burning their victim. The judge stared with astonishment, and the priests were stupefied. What victim, said Judge Obadiah, burn whom? In Bombay itself? Bombay, cried Passepartout. Certainly, we're not talking about the pagoda of Pelagi, but the pagoda of Malabar Hill at Bombay. And as the proof, added the clerk, here are the desecrator's very shoes which he left behind him. Whereupon he placed a pair of shoes on his desk. "'My shoes!' cried Passepartout, in his surprise permitting this imprudent exclamation to escape him. The confusion of master and man, who had quite forgotten the affair at Bombay, for which they were now detained at Calcutta, may be imagined. Fix, the detective, had foreseen the advantage which Passepartout's escape gave him, and, delaying his departure for twelve hours, had consulted the priests of Malabar Hill, knowing that the English authorities dealt very severely with this kind of misdemeanor, he promised them a goodly sum in damages, and sent them forward to Calcutta by the next train. Owing to the delay caused by the rescue of the young widow, Fix and the priests reached the Indian capital before Mr. Fox and his servant, the magistrates having been already warned by a dispatch to arrest them should they arrive. Fix's disappointment when he learned that Phileas Fogg had not made his appearance in Calcutta may be imagined. He made up his mind that the robber had stopped somewhere on the route and taken refuge in the southern provinces. For twenty-four hours Fix watched the station with feverish anxiety. At last he was rewarded by seeing Mr. Fogg and Passepartout arrive, accompanied by a young woman whose presence he was not wholly at loss he was wholly at loss to explain. He hastened for a policeman, and this he, it, this was how the party came to be arrested and brought before Judge Obadiah. Had Passepartout been a little less preoccupied, he would have espied the detective ensconced in the corner of the courtroom, watching the proceedings with an interest easily understood, for the warrant had failed to reach him at Calcutta as it had done at Bombay and Suez. Judge Obadiah had unfortunately caught Passepartout's rash exclamation, which the poor fellow would have given the world to recall. "'The facts are admitted?' asked the judge. "'Admitted,' replied Mr. Fogg coldly. "'Inasmuch,' resumed the judge, "'as the English law pro protects equally and sternly the religions of the Indian people, and as the man Passepartout has admitted that he violated the sacred pagoda of Malabar Hill at Bombay on the 20th of October, I condemn the said Passepartout to imprisonment for 15 days and a fine of 300 pounds. 300 pounds? cried Passepartout, startled at the largeness of the sum. Silence! shouted the constable. And inasmuch, continued the judge, as it is not proved that the act was not done by the connivance of the master with his servant, and the master in any case must be held responsible for the acts of his paid servant, I condemn Phileas Fogg to a week's imprisonment and a fine of one hundred fifty pounds. 
Fix rubbed his hands softly with satisfaction. If Phileas Fogg could be detained in Calcutta a week, it would be more than time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout was stupefied. This sentence ruined his master. A wager of twenty thousand pounds lost because he, like a like a precious fool, had gone into that abominable pagoda. Phileas Fogg, as self-composed as if the judge did not in the least concern him, did not even lift his eyebrows while he was being pronounced. Just as the clerk was calling the next case, he rose and said, I offer bail. You have that right, returned the judge. Fix's blood ran cold. But he resumed his composure when he heard the judge announce that the bail required for each prisoner would be one thousand pounds. I will pay it at once, said Mr. Fogg, taking his roll of bank bills from the carpet bag, which Passepartout had by him, and placing them on the clerk's desk. This sum will be restored to you. Excuse me. <clears throat> This sum will be restored to you upon your release from prison, said the judge. Meanwhile, you are liberated on bail. Come, said Phileas Fogg to his servant. But, but let them at least give me back my shoes, cried Passepartout angrily. Ah, these are pretty dear shoes, he muttered as they were handed to him. More than a thousand pounds apiece, besides they pinch my feet. Mr. Fogg, offering his arm to Aouda, then departed, followed by the crestfallen Passepartout. Fix still nourished hope that the robber would not, after all, leave the two thousand pounds behind him, but would decide to serve out his week in jail, and issued forth on Mr. Fogg's traces. The gentleman took a carriage, and the party were soon landed on one of the quays. The Rangoon was moored half a mile off in the harbour, its signal of departure hoisted at the masthead. The masthead. Eleven o'clock was striking. Mr. Fogg was an hour in advance of time. Fix saw them leave that carriage and push off in a boat for the steamer, and stamped his feet with disappointment. The rascal is off after all, he exclaimed. Two thousand pounds sacrificed. He's as prodigal as a thief. I'll follow him to the end of the world if necessary, but at this rate he's going, the stolen money will soon be exhausted. The detective was not far wrong in making this conjecture. Since leaving London, with what, what with traveling expenses, bribes, the purchase of the elephant, bales and fines, Mr. Fogg had already spent more than five thousand pounds on the way, and the percentage of the sum recovered from the bank robber promised to the detectives was rapidly diminishing. That is the end of chapter 15, and tomorrow we'll read chapter 16, and to by tomorrow I probably mean Thursday, um, in which Fix does not seem to understand in the least what is said to him. And the first word is the, and I hope that you join us next time so that we can continue going around the world. Maybe they'll get close to Hong Kong finally, and that's all that I have. I don't have any um, traveling art galleries that appear to be um, coming right at this time. So, never mind. I see an art gallery coming this way. So let me get out of the way so the art gallery can uh, exhibit you. I don't know. I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I did this last time, but I filled it in today. Ta-da! Ba -da -ba -da. Um, I hope you have a good day. Um, thank you for tuning in to Heavy D Story.